Well, good morning, church. Good to see you. If you were here on Wednesday night, then you got a sneak peek of this incredible story. An incredible story that just, it's, it's a true story, and I can't wait. It's perfect. In fact, I'm going I'm to share it just right now here with you. There was a guy by the name of Steve Henning from Huntley, Illinois. Anybody know where Huntley, Illinois is? I don't, is it near Chicago? I don't know. Uh, he was two years old when he contracted spinal meningitis. It was the winter of 1943. Somebody tell me what was going on in the early 40s. Yeah, a lot of World War II, a lot of bad stuff. The world was in rough shape. Because of that, the doctors had a shortage of penicillin. And because of that, they could not provide Steve the simple treatment he needed. And sadly, as a result, he lost his hearing. It began to, to fade, and within, by the time he was two years old, Steve could no longer hear music or laughter or even the sound of the voices of those that he loved and his family closest to him. But in the winter of 2001, after 57 years, Steve learned of a surgical procedure that would possibly, still experimental, allow him to hear sound waves because they would bypass the now non-functioning part of his ear and travel directly to the auditory nerve. So on January 30th, Steve agreed to be operated on. But because this implanted device could not be activated until the swelling went down in his brain and his ear, the doctors and Steve had no clue if the operation was a success. In fact, they wouldn't know for the next six agonizing weeks. Finally, the day came. The day of reckoning, it was a blustery spring morning, just like today, and Steve was nervously wondering if the whole procedure had been in vain. So he gathered his wife, his family, the doctor, the audiologist came in and performed uh, the cochlear implant, and he began to, to uh, program it, and he looked over at Steve's wife, Pat, and the audiologist said, do you want to be the first one to attempt to speak to him? And she nodded. She said, yes, I think that would be fantastic. So the audiologist went up. He programmed the cochlear implant and turned it on, and Pat Henning leaned toward her husband and gently whispered, Steve's face broke into an immediate smile. Tears streamed down his face. The first words he was able to hear in six decades were words of love. And they were from the one who loved him most. But what if I told you there was someone who loves you even more than that couple? What if I were to tell you that not only does God love you, but he knows you by name? And today, I want to ask us a very poignant question. Do you believe that God still speaks? And if so, how do you discern his voice? How do you hear his voice above the noise? How do you discern when it's him speaking and not, and not just heartburn from the night before he shouldn't have that pizza? When it's not just indigestion. How do you know when God is truly talking to you? And how do you discern his voice when that situation comes up, when that job problem comes up, when you need to make that choice and when wisdom is needed, do you believe God speaks today? See, Moses had the exact same question, and he had a powerful encounter, and that's what we're going to look at, Exodus chapter 3. If you want to look at it with me, Exodus chapter 3, I'm going to read from the CSB today, a beautiful, very uh, literal, conservative translation. Starting here in verse 1, chapter 3, he says this, meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side, your, your Bible may say the back side of the wilderness, and came to Horeb. Your Bible may say Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. As Moses looked, he saw that the bush was on fire, but it wasn't consumed. So Moses thought, man, I must go over and look at this incredible sight. Why isn't the bush burning up? When the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to look, God called out to him from the bushes and said, Moses, Moses, here I am, he answered. Do not come any closer, he said. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Some cultures still do this today. Do you notice that? You ever been to somebody's house? They treat it with respect and say, take your shoes off. See, this goes all the way back to the days of Moses. Then he continued, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. 
Moses hid his face because he was afraid to even look at God. Years ago, there was this great book that came out called Experiencing God. Anybody remember that? Yeah, an incredible, incredible Bible study. Henry Blackaby and Charles, uh, Claude King wrote this. Bestseller book. They took this passage right here in Exodus chapter 3, and they wrote four distinguishing marks of God speaking. All right, we'll just hit them real quick here. The first one was this. When God spoke, it was usually unique to the individual. Okay, did you catch that? It was very specific. In this case, the burning bush. It was different for Abraham, different for Elijah, different for Samuel. The second truth, when God spoke, the person was sure God was speaking. There was no mistake, like, God, is that you? In fact, in this case, God introduced himself. There was no mistaking it. We know that God introduced himself, and Moses hid as a result. The third truth, when God spoke, the person knew what God said. There was no doubt. There was no, uh, I don't really know if he's saying, you know, it's like, they might have doubted they were up for the job, but notice they never doubted what the job was. That's huge when you're listening to God. And the last truth that they point out, when God spoke, this was the encounter. This, this was it. Okay? There was no, go look behind another bush. Or Moses, okay, now you found me. I'm going to go over here and hide behind this door. And then if you do this, it's going to be a treasure hunt. No, meeting God is the encounter. Meet, God is enough. It's not like, well, there's, there's hidden gold under this tree. God is the gold. This is the experience. God speaking. This is what we long for. Now, we look at this and we say, well, pastor, that was Moses. You know, I mean, it was different back then. God spoke, and I get it because we read in Exodus 33 very clearly, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. You ever thought about that? How awesome, how terrifying would that be? For the God of the universe to come and speak. And we think, well, you know, he may not appear visibly or speak face to face like that. But I promise you, God is still speaking to us today. In fact, not only can we be sure he's speaking, we can be certain of what he's saying. We can actually have an encounter with the living God. All right? It is so important. Henry Blackaby in the Experiencing God study, he stated this. He says, if you are having trouble hearing God speak, then you are in trouble. You're in trouble at the very heart of your Christian experience. On Wednesday night, we talked about this in John 10. Jesus says, my sheep, they hear my voice, and they know. They follow me. The great I am is still speaking. So how can we tell? All right. So what we're going to do is I want to take us from how God generally speaks to everyone, and then I want to compare it and bring it down closer, more personal, to how God speaks specifically to you if you are a follower of Christ. All right? So the first way that God speaks to everyone is this. He speaks through creation. Most of you get that. But some people think, I don't understand that. God speaks through creation. A lot of times people go, man, I just wish God would write it on the night nice sky as love for me. Or introduce himself. or do." Something. He does. That's exactly what he does. Look at Psalm 19. He says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night. They display knowledge. And we know this to be true. When you go out in creation, nobody stands at the edge of the Grand Canyon and says, wow, I feel so huge and important and great, right? We don't do that. We don't stand and look at the night sky and see countless stars and go, I feel important. I'm, I'm huge. I'm great. Look how powerful. I know. We know because we, there's something greater than us. We are put in our place by the vastness of the ocean by the majestic mountain range. And we see God's hand around. Somebody built that. This pulpit implied a pulpit builder. Right? His name was Eli. We know this. We can know him. We can have a relationship. We can touch him. A world implies a world maker. And we know this to be true. In this moment, we know there's something greater. It's the creator God speaking. This is why Paul says this in Romans 1. He says, for what can be known about God is plain to them. Because he's shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. Oh, here's his last part. So they are without excuse. See, God speaks to us through his creation. He shows us what is valuable to him. Order, symmetry, creativity, consistency, beauty. All these are godly characteristics. They come from him. 
When you put your hand right here, you feel that. Do, 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 do. I hope you feel that, right? When you breathe in, and you get those air in your lungs. You didn't command yourself to do that. We're, this is out of our control. We are in God's domain. The creator is there. We know we are not the ruler of this world. There is a creator. He's speaking to us, trying to get our attention through his creation. The next way that he speaks to everyone, generally, is through our conscience. All of us have a conscience. Christian, non-Christian. Believer, non-believer. Pagan, atheist. It does. Every one of us has a conscience. This is different than Holy Spirit conviction. We're going to come to that in a minute. Look at what Paul wrote in Romans 2. He says, even Gentiles, okay, so even, even the people who don't know the law, even the, not the Jews, we're talking like lost people, me, you, people, you know, that don't have this, this, this godly Hebrew heritage, even the Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. Did you catch that? They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts. For their own conscience, there's that word, their thoughts either accuse them or acquit them. Right? They either accuse them or they tell them, hey, you're on the right path. You're doing the right thing. But here's the problem. The conscience cannot be fully trusted. I want to be very, very, very clear about this. Okay? If you're listening at home, the conscience cannot be fully trusted because of sin, because we have all fallen short of God's glory. Things that we, we'll discuss this in a minute. Our consciences can be deceived, and our conscience is limited to a degree. How many times have you heard somebody say, just trust your heart. Right? Just go with your gut. You know, let, let your spirit animal <laughs> be your guide. No! That's horrible advice. When you read Jeremiah, it says the heart is deceitful above all things. How many times, if you, if you had followed your heart, would you be where you are? To think about that. The heart is so fickle. We know it. We may not like to admit it. Don't trust your heart. The heart is deceitful above all things. It could be desperately wicked. In fact, the Bible goes so far as to say you can actually sear your conscience by giving over to sin, even to the demonic realm. Right? So we have to be very wise and exercise discernment when it comes to listening to and obeying our conscience. But there is no doubt that it, written on every one of our hearts is eternity and the weight that comes with it. In fact, Ecclesiastes 3.11 literally says that. God has placed eternity on the human heart. It's in everyone's heart. Okay? You sit still long enough. You be quiet long enough, your conscience will bear witness to the fact that you know, if you're honest, you know right from wrong. Every one of us know that. You have a desire for justice to take place. You have a desire, you have an in, a God-implanted desire for things to be made right. And you know, as things are now, they're not. You instinctively know that. Why? Because you have the divine nature. You have desires in this world that this world, as it is now, can't possibly fill. How do you know these things? Not because you learned them. It's because someone wrote them on your heart. God, he is speaking those things. He implanted those. The third way God speaks is through circumstances. Through circumstances. Whether they're your own circumstances or the circumstances of others. Again, it takes spiritual discernment to know what he's saying here. Just like with our consciences, we have to be careful how we interpret circumstances. But there is no question God speaks to us through what comes our way, through circumstances, through opportunities. A lot of times, God will use circumstances for good and bad, good and bad circumstances, to get your attention, to listen to him. I love how C.S. Lewis puts it. He says this, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our consciences. And he shouts to us in our pain. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Isn't that great? Don't you wish you could write stuff like that? It's like, well, I write like, <laughs> God is good. You know, it's just amazing. I love it. So in creation, in conscience, insert. notice they all start with C. I'm giving you a hint here. They're all starting with letter C. These are what we call general revelation. This is the way that God speaks to every person that has ever walked the earth. But now we're turning a corner. I want us to go deeper. This is how God speaks specifically to us as followers of Christ. And that's the fourth one. God speaks through Christ. Don't miss this. Jesus is the final and full revelation of God. You need to hear that because you're hearing a bunch of lies. You're hearing there's many ways to God. You're hearing, well, there's a new Bible part two that was written in the 1800s. I've got some dear friends that believe that. No. 
God's word is complete because Jesus said the full and final revelation from God the Father is Christ. Look at John chapter 1. It says this. In the beginning was the word. Okay, that's Jesus. And the word, Jesus, was with God and the word, Jesus, was God. How do we know that? Read on. And the word became what? <laughs> Flesh. And he dwelt among us. We've seen his glory. The glory is of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Did you catch that? Jesus is the full, the final revelation of God the Father. I want us to see today, God is not playing some sick cosmic game of hide and seek with you. He's not playing Marco Polo. You can find Marco Polo, Marco, where's God? Oh, I don't know. He's hiding from me. That's not God. We don't serve a capricious God. I know everything. I know I have a perfect plan for your life, but I'm just not going to tell you. Can you imagine? God's not like a middle schooler who's mad at you. He is the sovereign creator, and he gives us truth, and he speaks through Christ. God is saying, I am right here. How do we recognize the voice of God? Get to know the voice of Jesus. He told his disciples in John 14, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. If you hear from Jesus, you are hearing from God the Father. In fact, some of your Bibles, if you look, may even have the words of Jesus written in red. The red letters, right? So you want to know God? Read the red. This is incredible. We see, we know the actual words of Jesus in the scripture. Read the red. It is authoritative. When Jesus speaks, God the Father speaks. And that's our next truth. God speaks through his canon, his canon of scripture. Canon simply means measuring stick or the authoritative collection, the standard. This is your standard. So you know I got to ask. Are you letting it be your standard? When decisions come, when you got to make those hard calls, are you letting this be the standard of truth? Or are you going with secular human wisdom? Are you going with what your buddy says, who doesn't know God? This is the authoritative, blameless, perfect word of God. When the Bible speaks, God speaks. Here's just a few passages I want you to see concerning the power of the word of God. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8 says this. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Did you catch that? Man, that's power. Matthew 24. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Did you catch that? Heaven and earth will pass away. What's that, Pastor Matt? Behold, I am making all things new, a new heaven and a new earth. This world as you see it now is not your forever home. Heaven as it exists now is not your forever home. He is making all things new. We forget that. I'm going to preach on that. We've got to come back to Revelation 21 and 20. It, this is so amazing. Everything we see will pass away except the words will not pass away. We have the scripture. Look at Hebrews 4.12. This is so great. For the word of God is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. Y'all, that's piercing of joint and marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of, what, what's that word? Heart, the deceitful heart. 2 Timothy 3 says this, all scripture is breathed out by God. All scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And what we talked about last week, 1 Peter 1.21. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. This is not a man-made thing, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. There was this great song that came out in the 70s. I'm not going to name it because you know it and it's kind of a little, a little creepy. But he said, when I sat down to write the words of that song that went to number one, it was as if something possessed me and moved my hand. And the word became oh, so creepy. And it's a pretty demonic song. I won't name it. You know what I'm talking about, right? And they did. They were moved along by the Holy Spirit. I picture this. They were, God was speaking through them, and he's still speaking today. He speaks through his word. This is why it is so frustrating when people say, I don't hear God speak to me. I saw this great meme. It tells you the whole truth if you can handle it. Don't say God is silent when your Bible's closed. God is speaking. We have the living, breathing word of God, and we're like, oh, that's right. I should probably read that. I put it in the back of my car, and I haven't seen it since last Sunday. There it says, God is still speaking. Church, this is why it is so important to have that time in his word 
when you open up your Bible, you spend time alone with God, he will speak to you through his word, through the power of the Holy Spirit, which brings us to the next way God communicates. He speaks through the counsel of his Holy Spirit, the precious Holy Spirit. One of the Holy Spirit's roles is to glorify Jesus by taking what he said and enable us to understand it, to obey it. That's why sometimes on Wednesday night you'll hear Pastor Bill or Pastor Jason or Pastor me, <laughs> myself, will say, Holy Spirit, will you be our teacher tonight? Will you be our, 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 our messenger? Will you, will you be the spirit of truth, the counselor that reveals truth? In fact, John chapter 6 says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will speak, not on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak from me. He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So God speaks to us through his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will never contradict his word. You need to hear that. I am seeing so many people. I've got Facebook friends that have friended me from all over the planet, and they are putting some of the most ungodly, unbiblical truth out there. They're like, oh, well, the Holy Spirit gave me a revelation. I'm like, that. <laughs> what are you reading? That's not even scriptural. It's not even biblical. The Holy Spirit will never contradict the Holy Bible. Did you catch that? They will align. They will, they will support each other. God is not the author of confusion. You know who is? The devil. Satan is the author. He is so sneaky. I read just this week about a family in Peru who bought a puppy from a vendor in Lima, Peru. He was so cute, so cuddly, so full of energy, they called him Run Run. <laughs> Run Run, okay? He was playing with the family, and he was doing great, and he got bigger, and he got more aggressive, and he got more full of energy, and he was going crazy, and everybody loved him until one day... He stopped getting along with others. And he started to show this aggression. He began fighting with other dogs and trying to dominate them. And then he would sneak out. He would start killing chickens anywhere he would find them. He, would, he was going, sorry, Leanne, right? Don't keep them near you. He, he would start killing all these chickens. And he'd come home with like chickens. People were like, what happened to cute little Run Run? Well, it turns out Run Run wasn't a cute little puppy. Run Run ended up being a wild Andean fox. <laughs> from the Andes Mountains. Now, look in his eyes, y'all. Would you pet that? That thing, he is staring a hole right through you. you should, his name shouldn't be Run Run. His name should be Kill Kill. <laughs> he will flat out kill you. Oh, I got to think, the devil is just like that. He sneaks in. He's all cuddly and cute. Oh, this, I will love him and pet him and call him George. No, he's not your friend. The devil is sneaky. He starts out all innocent, but then he is a dangerous fox. You know what his passion is? To steal, kill, and destroy. To sow confusion. That's John 10.10. 10. So church, we have got to stay close enough to the Lord to recognize his voice. Not the crafty, sneaky fox. Run, run is not your friend. God's word is. The counsel of the spirit. The holy scriptures. These are are where we find truth. So if you ever sense God prompting you toward an action to do something or to say something to someone, you know, I'll give examples in just a minute. The Holy Spirit and God's word will act in accord. They will always line up. They will always support you, always. The last way God is still speaking to us today specifically is through his church. And I love this. He's speaking through you. What we're doing right now, the teaching, the preaching of God's word. When you were in small groups, when you're hearing God's truth, he has established that preaching and teaching as a means of how he communicates truth today. Look at Romans 10, 14. He says this, how then can they call on him that they haven't believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. Did you catch that? The, the wisdom of God, it is the church of God now that is proclaiming the word of God. That proclamation of the word, this is where we hear one of the ways of him speaking. God is speaking when his word is being declared honestly and with clarity. By the way, the church there also means the gathering of saints, the ecclesia. It literally means the called out assembly. You are the congregation. That means you. There is wisdom found in the multitude of counselors. You are counselors with each other when we come together. This is why it blows my mind 
why people would skip out on church. I, I'm not saying it's just because I work here. <laughs> Long before I was a pastor, I was part of the local church. Long after, I'm no longer a pastor. When I retire in 59 years from now, you, why are you laughing? <laughs> when I retire one day, I will still be a part of God's church. I will still support it. Does that make sense? Because it's greater than us. It is the ecclesia. We are supposed to be called out. We, how are we supposed to be the lighthouse if we blend in? We're called out. We are the ecclesia. God speaks to his church. And why someone would not make a habit of showing up where God speaks, I will never know. Together, in the word of God, filled with his spirit, we can rightly discern the voice of God. So are you struggling to hear God's voice? Because this helps. When you're in his word, when you're around like-minded believers who can help you discern these areas, there are some places where God speaks so clearly you do not even have to question it. Some things that are so true, so black and white, he's laid it on his word. For example, uh, sexual immorality. Don't do it. Serving, giving, do it. Live generously, be open-handed. Justice, righteousness, love it, right? Fight for it. The Ten Commandments, obey them. They're not the Ten Suggestions. They're, they're the Ten Commandments for a reason. Evangelism. Missions. We, we don't have to wonder whether or not we should share the gospel. We don't have to wonder whether or not we should be living on mission and supporting those who are willing to do that. In fact, on Sunday, May 22nd, you are going to have a chance to support our missionaries. You're going to have a chance to do just that. It's going to be so awesome. Don't miss it. Sunday, May 22nd, you'll have a chance to support our missionaries. All right? So God is speaking very clearly in some things, but what do you do about the gray areas? Pastor, what do I do, man? I'm facing a situation here. I need to know if I should make a move to this new location. Does God word address that? Pastor, I've got some questions here. Is this the right time for a career change? Pastor, I'm, I'm praying it's kind of a gray area. Do I move forward with this adoption? Because I kind of feel like the door is open, but I'm just still not sure. Pastor, do I take this next step in this relationship? After church today. Pastor, where do I eat? Do I go to Olive Garden or Ruckus? Because they're both so good. Or even worse, do I go to Los Tres or La Rancherita? It's tough, right? What are you going to do? I'll tell you, I'll make it easy. God is in all those places, by the way. They're all good. What do you do? This is where God uses his Holy Spirit in his church to help you clarify if he's speaking, how he's speaking, when he's speaking. He will use people in the process. And, and here's a side note. He will also offer you his peace. If you do not sense the peace of the Holy Spirit with your decision, keep praying. Remember, God is not the author of confusion. He is the Prince of Peace. There's something about when he speaks. I'm telling you, no doubt about it, God is still in the speaking business. And we can know what he's saying. There's nothing like hearing the voice of God. Now, there are some things. I'm just going to go there because i got just enough time. There are some things, if we're honest, that stop us from hearing God's voice. You ready? Some of you are not. You got your pens. I see it. I'm just going to lay it out there. Don't hate me. Some of you ain't hearing from God because of this word right here. Sin. Whoa. What? You can't say that today. That's not politically correct. You can't call out sin. You're supposed to call it transgressions. Mistakes were made. <laughs> right? We don't own it. Mistakes were made. No. It's sin. It's unrighteousness. And it separates us. It doesn't lose our relationship with God. It separates our fellowship from God. That dark cloud moves between you and the sunshine. Is the sun still there? Of course it's still there. But because that cloud is separated, I no longer feel the warmth of the sun. Does that make sense? Sin separates us from hearing the clarity of God's voice. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says this. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. In fact, they're foolishness to him. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So there may be somebody today who's listening to this, and you're hearing my voice, but it's not really making sense. You know why? It might be because you're still in your natural state, the natural fallen state of lostness, that all of us are born this way. In other words, if you've not trusted Christ fully as your redeemer, if you've not had that spiritual transformation, that grafting into his family, then the enemy still has you blindfolded. There are still scales covering your eyes. 
You ever have somebody you're talking to, you're trying to share the faith, and they're just not getting it? Like these spiritual things, it's so clear to you, but you're looking like, why don't they get it? This is how. This is why. They don't know the Lord yet. Don't give up on them. They just don't know yet. They're still in their natural fallen state. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 goes on to say this. The enemy has blinded the minds of unbelievers. It keeps them from seeing the light of the gospel. It keeps them from seeing the glory of Christ, who is the very image of God. All right, so what do we do? We keep praying for them. We keep loving them. We keep sharing with them. But ultimately, hear this. This is in God's hands. This is God's timing. He is the one that does the saving. Your job, don't give up on them. Keep loving them. Keep praying for them. Keep sharing. Keep inviting them. But mark it down. Even those who are saved, when sin comes between you and the Lord, it can break that clarity, that fellowship with God. You hear the voice of God and then suddenly it seems dim. Is there something in your life that's unconfessed? This is why it's so important to keep short accounts with God, to live a life of confession. Same thing the Bible tells us with our spouse. Never go to bed with anger in your heart. Do not let the sun set on your wrath. Don't turn your back to that spouse. That gives a mighty foothold for the devil. Turn towards them. Work it out. Don't go to bed. Keep short accounts. Don't go three months from now and come up to me and go, hey, this has been bothering me for a while. I've been meaning to talk. No, you haven't been meaning to talk. Or you would have. Right? You come up and hug me. I assume we're great. I come up and hug you, you can assume we're great. I'm not going to come up and blindside you six months from now and go, man, I can't believe you've been doing it. Why would you tell me that now? Let me know. Keep short accounts. Don't you want that with your friendships? It's no different than our Heavenly Father. The second reason some of us don't hear from God, is because of stubbornness. Mm -mm -mm. Y'all, this is a big reason. Listen to Hebrews 3, 7, and 8. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts like those in the rebellion. Today, as long as it is called today, exhort one another that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You know what I imagine here? Calluses. You know how you work, you get calluses on your hand. I don't because I have soft hands, but some of you at work, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You get those calluses. It's like our hearts. They become hardened and cold. It's not that God's not speaking. It's our cold, hardened heart. We haven't obeyed what he said to do. When you're a kid, you've asked them to do repeatedly the same thing, and they refuse to do it. Does it affect your relationship with them in the short term? Absolutely. Will you please do it? Ah, you haven't done that yet. You need to make it right. It's that stubbornness. Think about this. You know, when we don't surrender, but instead we get stubborn and prideful, we have trouble hearing God speak. Is that you? Is that why maybe you're hearing fog, noise, or silence? Think about Moses, the very first one we read about this morning. For 40 years, this guy was out in the desert, in the backside of nowhere. I mean, it was desolate. There was nothing to do. He wandered around. God was ready to get his attention. He was out there. We're talking like past Siler City. Past Tashi Station, past Mos Eisley, he was all the way out near Jakku. Some of you don't get that, but do we have that actual photo of, of Moses in the wilderness where he was hiding and, and looking for sin? I think, I think we, yeah, there he is right there. If you look closely down in the bottom left corner, here's Moses right there. He's got his helmet on because he doesn't want to hear God. Star Wars reference. Check. This is what I picture with Moses. He's out in the desert, eating his little puffy rations, waiting for God to speak. You think God didn't want to speak for 40 years? Think about this. Some of us are not hearing God speak because of our stubbornness and our pride. And we're wondering, God, why don't you talk to me? You know what my challenge is? I'm just going to go there. I want you to go back to the last time you thought you heard God. When he spoke to you and gave you something clearly to do. Did you do it? Did you do it? Did you go to that person and seek their forgiveness when he laid it on your heart? Or maybe did you offer forgiveness when God laid it on your heart? If you didn't, then you're stubborn. We're being disobedient. Did you share Jesus with that person when God laid it on your heart and he prompted you to do it? 
If you didn't, that's stubbornness. It can affect your relationship. Did you give to that missionary or that ministry when God laid it on your heart they needed support? When God told you to do something, did you not do it? Don't let stubbornness and pride keep you from hearing from the great I am. Allow your heart to be soft. And then walk out in obedience and surrender to Jesus. The third reason people don't hear God speak is because of our self. Self. We are too busy wrapped up in ourselves. We are too busy living for ourselves, too busy wrapped up and focused and listening to just what we want, and as a result, we don't hear God speaking. See, our wants are drowning out the voice of God. Our dreams for ourselves are louder than his dreams for us. I'm going to tell you something, guys. When self is the driving force behind anything you do, you can bet God is not the voice behind it. In fact, when I read scripture, it tells me, die to myself. The actual words are crucify. Crucify my own flesh. When God speaks, every aspect of selfishness is crucified. So you know, I got to ask, how are you doing with that? Got room to improve? Good. We all do. That's why we're here. That's what's so awesome about God's word. When we live for ourselves, man, it hinders God speaking to us in a clear way. God had to rid Moses of himself before finally he revealed himself and he spoke to Moses and look how clear it was. All right. But what happens, pastor, if we look at these three barriers in life and I honestly, I'm just being humble and honest, I honestly don't see any of those barriers in my life, yet God still seems silent. What then? Pastor, what do I do? I mean, I'm, I'm trying my best. I'm living for Christ. I, I'm seeking him. I'm reading his word. I'm spending time with to the best of my knowledge. I'm, I'm living a repentant lifestyle. I'm trying to be obedient to him. But for whatever reason, I still feel like God seems silent. Is there anything I can do during that time. Yes. I can tell you from scripture. Good things come. To those who wait on the Lord. There's just one problem. We don't like. To wait. Do we? None of us woke up this morning and say. I can't wait to go out to eat today. And stand in a long line. I can't wait to go to the hospital with my broken arm. And sit in the waiting room. For seven hours. It's going to be delightful. We don't like to wait. Man, I want to have that thing. <laughs> Download it. I need that. I need that. It's going to be four to six weeks. No, you don't, Amazon Prime, baby. Boom, it's there. Overnight. In fact, it's probably in your house right now. I want that song. I want that app. Just download it. Push a button. I don't want to wait on dinner. Okay, order the appetizer. It's ready. They'll nuke it. They'll bring it out. Well, how about this one? Man, I really, really, really want, no, 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 sorry. <clears throat> I need that brand new car. And I don't want to wait. I don't want to have to save and pay for it. I want to take out a loan. After all, the guy was really nice. He said, why don't you enjoy it while you pay for it? <laughs> right? If he laughed like Satan, we'd be like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> but he doesn't. Right? So you want to finance that at 27% for the next 5, 7, 20 years? All good. Sign right here. We don't like to wait. We make it so easy. Oh, we hate waiting. But in God's economy, waiting on him produces something in us that nothing else can produce. Look at Moses. Man, let's learn from him. He was waiting in the desert wilderness for 40 years before God spoke. 40 years. That's older than some of us in this room. I know some of you are like, wow, that's encouraging, Pastor. 40, that's awesome. But what was he doing? In those 40 years. You ready? I'm going back to the very first verse. You know what he was doing? He was tending his father-in-law's flock. In other words, he was staying faithful and doing the next thing. He was putting one foot in front of the other. He didn't cower in the fetal position and say, I don't know what I'm doing, so I'm going to freeze and paralyze in fear. He did. He was going about his daily routine being faithful, being obedient, living as best as he can in righteousness. And God showed up and it spoke and it changed the whole trajectory of his life. 
He had one encounter with God, and it changed everything. So seek his presence. I read recently about the Navy SEALs, and they have this phrase, go all the way back to, uh, to, to Vietnam. The phrase is this. It's kind of weird if, you don't, if you've never heard it. Always keep one foot in the water. Always keep one foot in the water. You know why? No matter what enemy they're facing, Navy SEALs are confident that if they can just get into the water, they'll have the advantage. You know why? Because they're trained to thrive in that environment. This is so good. That environment, though, is dangerous to everyone else. That environment is fatal to the enemy. Guys, think about that. The presence of God to us is like water to the Navy SEAL. I mean, for us, the presence of God, this is where we thrive. This is where the lies of the enemy die. You want to hear God's voice? Keep one foot in his presence. Always keep one foot in the presence of God because the moment we retreat from his presence, you're going to lack the clarity. But when you keep one foot in his presence, all the lies of the enemy, all the discouragement, the hopelessness, the powers, it falls away and we're filled with truth. The truth that he is with us, that there is hope for your situation. You are not hopeless. You are not alone. He is still speaking. So if you're in a period of time where God sees silent, here's what I want you to do. I want you to keep waking up and reading his word. I want you to keep looking for one foot in his presence. Keep coming to the church. Keep coming to your small group. Get wise counsel. Surround yourself with people who bring you up, not bring you down. Keep walking in truth. Stay plugged in. Parents, get your kids plugged in. Gather with the saints, the ecclesia, as often as you can, and keep living a life of surrender to your creator. Keep doing what you're doing, and God will come through. He will speak. If you listen closely enough, we can hear him saying, I am still speaking. I'm still speaking. Let's pray about it. Would you bow with me right where you are? God, in the quiet of this moment, we listen for your voice. Thank you that you didn't create the world, wind it up, and just let it go like a top, but you are actively involved, that you gave us your word, you gave us the counsel of the spirit, you give us Christ, you give us so many ways that you are actively speaking. Lord, would you help us to cut through the clutter, to, to quiet the noise, and to focus on you, to hear your voice. Help us to tune out the distractions of this world. Holy Spirit, speak to us during these moments. As always, you are the guest of honor, and we listen. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to stand. If you're new here, we just like to sing one last song of worship before we go. It's the highlight of our day. We open up the altar. If you want to come and pray, feel free to do that. No one will bother you. There's just something special when you come and you kneel and you listen to your Savior. Maybe you want to pray for a lost family member, a lost friend. The altar is open. Let's stand together now. The words will be on the screen. The altar is open. Just be obedient to what the Lord is leading you to do today.